adapted to low low oxygen water and high high waste conditions in the water. Ten years ago, most people didn't know what a tilapia was. Nowadays, it's very commonly found in grocery stores. You can find it on a lot of restaurant menus. The main advantage to, tila to a tilapia is it is an omnivorous species, which means you can feed it anything from vegetables to meat, and you have to give it the right amount of protein, but you can actually raise it on a vegetarian insect diet. They reproduce very easily, so they're easy to breed. They grow fast, and they are very tasty. There's a couple of downsides or limitations that you have to be aware of. They require warm water because they are a tropical fish. And they are in it considered an invasive species, so a lot of them are not allowed, and some the rest of them are regulated. Here in Texas, you can have certain species of tilapia, but not others. And finally, they are not high in omega-3, although you can modify their diets to raise the omega-3 content. This is a picture of a tilapia tank, which is in uh, Illinois, at a place called Aqua Ranch, and they are in this particular tank, they are in there at one pound per gallon, which tells you something about the density which tilapia can be raised at if you keep the water clean, if you, get, if you remove the nitrates from the water that would otherwise harm the fish, the tilapia is perfectly healthy in this environment. Now, this can be scaled up to a huge degree, and that's what I'm saying about being able to put a dent in the seafood demand. You can feed the system with commercial pelleted feeds. You can also feed it with a more sustainable diet of black soldier fly lyra, vegetable scraps, and other things which are considered waste products right now. If you come to booth 104, we have examples of black soldier fly production methods. This is the device that we use to raise this black soldier fly larva, which is called a biopod. We have one on display there, and we have some of the larva on display. The, uh, the biopod actually reduces pest populations, so when it's, when it's running properly, it's reducing your flies. This is the uh, black soldier fly in its, in its uh, adult stage. It lives for five days, it flies around, it mates, it lays it at its eggs, and it dies. So it doesn't eat in, that, in this stage, so it doesn't try to get in your house. So you really won't see these around very often. That's uh, that's a lot bigger than they are in reality. In reality, they're about an inch long. The grubs, when they're, when they're fully grown, when they're ready to feed to your chickens or your fish, they're about an inch long. They will eat almost anything. Now, for people getting into aquaponics, generally where they start out is with the barrel aquaponics system, and this was developed by a guy named Travis Huey He's in South Carolina. They use commonly available barrels and PVC fittings, which are plumbed together to form an aquaponic unit, which circulates water from the fish tank down at the bottom up to the dump tank at the top, and it periodically cycles tank the water through two, two and a half barrels, which are filled with gravel. As you can see, things grow pretty well in them. This is Travis Huey. He does a lot of work in Kenya and other third world nations, and he does really good work, so if you go to his his website, fastonline.org, you can actually download a barrel ponics unit manual for free, and I recommend you do a donation to his organization because he's done a lot of good work. This is my mini aquaponic unit, which is on display at booth 104. It uses two 10-gallon grow beds. It has a 7-gallon dump cycle, so it, it takes water from this dump tank here and it floods these two grow beds, and it flows down to, to the fish tank, which is down below. I have goldfish in here for my demonstration unit, although I you know, use tilapia at home. It also has a raft system demonstration up at the top. It only uses 19 watts of power. These are the grow beds. They flood and drain on a 10 minute cycle right now. Normally you would run it about a 1 hour to 30 minute cycle depending on the weather. When the roots get a good shot of oxygen with each cycle, that helps the plants to grow better. There are commercial, commercially produced small-scale systems. Uh, this is a farm in a box from Earth Solutions. Uh, there's quite a few out there. If you contact me, I can hook you up with a lot of different uh, vendors for those. I think they're selling these at Home Depot in some places. This is a larger small-scale system, sort of a school-sized system. It's made by a company called Crop King. 
This is a raft based small system. Uh, you probably can't read all of these, it's too small. But the uh, aquaponics.com has a whole range of different size systems that they sell anywhere from $3,700 to $14,000 for a fairly, you know, it's a medium sized system, I guess. This is one of the systems I've studied. It's a commercial system. This is in Flanagan, Illinois. It's a place called Aqua Ranch. They have a, two full-size greenhouses where they raise basil and lettuce for the local Chicago market. This is a commercial system which I've studied at length. It's up in near uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is basil grown in large raftways and the tilapia are actually underneath the basil. This is a system that's going in in Colorado by a name company called Quatrix. And this is one, it's kind of a dark slide, but this is one that used to be operating up in Massachusetts and for financial reasons they, they lost financing during construction and they operated for about 10 years. It's kind of a long story, but it's a 22,000 square foot facility that uh, produced, gosh I can't remember the numbers, but thousands of cases of basil every year and it was designed to, to produce up to a million pounds of tilapia per year, and this is in a 22,000 square foot building. This tells you something about the production density which can be achieved with an aquaponic system. And this is again, what I'm talking about, about making a dent in the seafood demand. These systems can be scaled to a very large degree, almost infinitely, and if we can produce enough fish, cheaply enough, we can reduce pressure on the ocean the outside the bio shelters back when it was operating for 10 years up in Massachusetts. So there's a, aquaponics is still, you know, just a few places commercially doing this. And it's kind of because it requires a lot of expertise in aquatics and horticulture at the same time. It is somewhat energy intensive because tilapia require heat. And so in northern climates, you have to keep in mind that heat demand banks aren't really crazy about funding this because they haven't heard of it before. And of course we're competing with subsidized agriculture, which is sort of another long story right there. Subsidized agriculture, conventional agriculture, is shifting costs. And so if they had to pay their true costs, aquaponics would be a no-brainer. So here we get to some problems which I've tried to identify that aquaponics can address. Number one is the destruction of the planet from overfishing. We have a large problem with the over demand and undersupply of fish in the ocean. We finally we're reaching the end of the road on that. We also want to grow healthy food close by to home, reduce our food miles. We have a growing population. We're going to peak out somewhere around 9 billion people. And we got to figure out how to feed them without destroying the planet. We have water shortages now that we didn't know we didn't have before. The aquifers are being drained. The climate is changing somewhat, so we have water shortages in many areas that we didn't used to have before. And we've always had inefficient use of energy and waste resources. I think we can address a lot of those issues with a permaculture, aquaculture, or aquaponics system. And of course, we have the pollution from conventional agriculture and aquaculture, which we'll go into a little bit later. Now some facts about overfishing that some people are surprised to know is that we have pretty cleanly scraped the barrel. We're getting to be, within the next 20 or 30 years, we are going to be out of ocean fish as far as the predator species go that we are currently harvesting. You can see the global catch has basically peaked back in the mid to late 1990s and it's probably along since then, but it is no longer rising at the rate that it was because we have figured out how to catch them more efficiently and we are reaching the end of their supply, their ability to meet our demand. This graph shows how conventional marine capture has peaked back in 1987 and it bobbles along pretty much the same since then and the yellow and the orange